This is a patient who has about three diopters of against real astigmatism in a somewhat dense cataract, and the capsular rexus is starting off reasonably well. But as the surgeon is propagating the tear inferiorly, the rexus is running out. Here we see it at the pupil margin. And uh, the surgeon, unfortunately, fails to bring the rexus in. Insufficient vector forces are used here. And uh, the rexus continues to propagate out. Now it's under the iris, and it appears now it's actually quite far into the periphery, probably at the equator near the zonular insertion. So tripan blue is used here, uh, and this will allow us to see how far the tear has run out. This is a painting approach here that is more controlled under um, the viscoelastic, which is already in the anterior chamber. We'll then inject more cohesive viscoelastic here to help, help with visualization. And what we'll note here is that there's a very large rexus runout. Uh, we'll attempt to salvage the rexus to keep it continuous by using a stretching technique, stretching the rexus, the capsule here, to uh, redirect it toward the center. We're able to do this, but there is certainly a very large area that is run out into the capsular equator here, zonular insertion, uh, inferiorly and infronasal. Uh, the first priority here will be to get the cataract out successfully here, and uh, this is will be facilitated with hydrodissection. Because the uh, capsulotomy or the capsular rexus is fairly large, uh, this will actually make it actually easier to remove uh, the dense cataract. Here we're going to use a vertical chop technique here uh, using longitudinal phaco initially with a vertical chopper to create a central crack and then split that uh, nucleus into uh, two. Torsional phaco is used then to remove one hemi section in a hemi flip technique here and again this has become a bit easier because of how large that capsular rexus is. Uh, we'll now remove the uh, second hemi nucleus here uh, sufficiently. One of the considerations in this case is this patient uh, has requested and requires uh, a fairly large cylinder toric lens. This is a T7 lens, um, which uh, is to correct the three diopters of corneal astigmatism. This is approximately five diopters of cylinder on this, uh, on this lens implant. Uh, one of the concerns here, and here we can see during the IA, um, the cortex is removed. But we'll see here actually how large this area is. There's about... 90 degrees plus where that capsular excess has run out. And this is concerning because uh, of concerns when, with the NIA well in the capsular bag, particularly one piece lens in the capsular bag, the optic and or the haptic may prolapse out of the bag anteriorly, rotate, uh, it may sublux uh, anteriorly as well as uh, cause UGA syndrome. So here's a toric lens in, you can see the uh, marks aligned here. Um, we are using inkless marks on the cornea um, but we're sitting temporal here, and basically the axis of implantation is 170 degrees. You can see the haptic optic junction is beyond the anterior capsule overlap here, and we are concerned leaving the lens like this may not be well supported, uh, especially with capsule contractors. So we are going to proceed now with doing a posterior capsular rexus. And the idea here is that we're going to keep the lens in the capsular bag, but we're going to prolapse the optic through the capsular rexus posteriorly. This is the uh, posterior optic buttonhole technique. It's a 27-gauge needle with viscoelastic on it, beveled down, that's been used to pierce through the central posterior capsule, very thin, of course. Viscoelastic has been injected to, into burger space to keep the vitreous back, just a little bit, not too much. And now a microforcep is used to propagate the tear. Now, the posterior capsule is fairly thin, obviously, compared to the anterior capsule. But the principles are the same in performing a capsular rexus using vector forces and shearing forces, folding the capsule over to make this a continuous smooth tear. Frequent regrafts are helpful as the control is somewhat less in this thinner capsule area. A microforcep is helpful, of course, to work more posteriorly than we're used to working in the anterior chamber for an anterior capsular rexus. In this capsular rexus, we want to make it uh, about five, maybe four and a half, five millimeters not too large, and we want to make a central here. Uh, and this is successfully done here at this point in time. The one-piece lens here, which again needs to be at least in the capsular bag and should not be placed in the sulcus, uh, is now repositioned here. The haptics again are in the capsular bag, and the optic is currently as well. And now we're going to use a couple of hooks here to prolapse uh, the optic through the posterior capsular rexus. You can see how the rexus is reasonably round and centered. And those are the marks on the cornea we're just showing with the Wexel drying. And uh, the toric marks are nicely aligned here. Again, leaving this position, I was concerned that this lens may not be stable. 
we prolapse one pole of the optic behind the uh, posterior capsule and then prolapse the uh, other aspect of the pole of that optic behind the posterior capsule. This is facilitated by using a Kuglin hook on the rex's edge to help to stretch it while using a Sinsky to push down the optic through that um, posterior capsule rexus to buttonhole the optic. Uh, we're almost there here. We'll continue to push posteriorly to get the uh, most of the entire optic behind the posterior capsule. Of course, haptic optic junction is partially still in the capsular bag anterior to the posterior capsule on both sides. This will allow for a very solid and secure position of this lens. This lens will not rotate and the lens will be well secured. And in the presence of a very large capsular rexus, which we could have gone through a three-piece lens, which is vaulted and more stable in this uh, large capsular rexus or a lens in the sulcus, but we'd lose the torque correction. And here we're able to maintain the torque correction without uh, compromising the position of the lens and uh, worrying about a one-piece lens that may be potentially uh, sublux or rotating with capsular contracture. There you can see the posterior capsular rexus edge of that, uh, of that edge that's uh, prolapsed here. The optic is prolapsed through on both sides. And uh, we see the cat's eye appearance of the posterior capsule. You can see the anterior capsule is present that was, of course, run out, partially covering the optic as well. So my class put in, and this uh, patient um, now has a one-piece lens, toric, secured on the posterior capsule. In stable position, should have excellent uh, refractive correction with minimal complications, no vitreous prolapse forward. And this is one way to manage a one-piece lens in the capsular bag through the posterior optic buttonhole technique in the presence of a very large capsular rexus to maintain security of this optic.